the title of my sermon this morning is some things that we falsely expect things that we expect to happen that won't happen and I'd like to talk about um, people who are not Christians or people who have been misled who have expectations but they won't realize what they're hoping will happen. I want to talk about some things that the church expects and uh, some things that we as Christians expect. So if you'll turn with me to the scriptures, the book of Acts, um, I'm going to, third chapter of the book of Acts, I'm going to read the uh, first eight verses of Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple, the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid by the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. And so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he was leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this Lord's Day morning. We thank you, Father, for the fellowship and love we can share as brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Father, that as we look at your word today, that your Holy Spirit might guide our understanding and that you might help us Lord to always uh, be faithful to you and not to expect things that won't happen in Christ's name amen and verse 5 of this passage of scripture that I just read to you there was this lame man by the gate beautiful going into the temple and the Bible tells us that he saw Peter and John coming, and he looked up at Peter and John expecting to receive something from them. What he expected, he did not get. He was looking for alms. He wanted money. Uh, the word alms is used many times in the King James Version. It comes from a Greek word meaning pity and mercy. In its original sense, when giving alms, you're dispensing mercy. He was expecting silver or gold, not a healing. I would expect that every one of us in life, we have times where we anticipate that certain things that will happen, that we expect certain things to happen. Um, many times, like you, I see people standing on the side of the street with the cardboard signs, expecting that someone uh, will give them some money and so they wait there patiently uh, holding their cardboard signs expecting that someone will give them money. We hear people make statements such as, well, I expect that they will arrive soon or I expect to see him walking through the door at uh, any moment. Um, I, I see young people uh, riding their motorcycles, uh, weaving in and out of traffic, and sometimes I'll say to myself, I expect that that man is going to have a wreck one of these days if he keeps driving that motorcycle like that. There are times in life when we expect certain things to happen that we know will happen, just like the people on the side of the street, the beggars. They know that someone, a few people, will give them some money. That's why they stand there. 
uh, the man at the temple who was begging. Um, he was expecting that some people would give him some money, and I'm sure some people did. We expect that at Christmas we will receive gifts, because we always have, or we expect that we will receive something on our birthdays. But that will not always happen. What we anticipate to happen, what we expect will happen, does not always happen. The reason they will not happen is because our expectations are based on faulty premises on faulty beliefs, on ex our expectations are placed on, a, uh, are based on misplaced prejudices or false conclusions, and as a result, some of the things that we expect will happen in this life will not happen. There are many in this world who are expecting that when they die, they will go to heaven. Millions are expecting to go to heaven. Um, however, their expectations more than likely will not happen. There are many who have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have never obeyed the gospel of Christ, but expect that they are basically, because they are basically good people, that they're going to go to heaven. Apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, they are expecting to be ushered into heaven but according to the scripture, the Bible, they will not be allowed into heaven. If you'll uh, turn with me to uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the seventh chapter, I'm just going to read a couple of verses. Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21 and reading through 23. This is what Jesus is speaking here. This is what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me at that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wondrous things in your name? And he will declare unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There are always those people who, who are expecting to go to heaven, even in the religious world. Uh, there are many people. The, the scripture that I just read, Jesus said, they're going to say to me, Lord, I've done many wondrous works, not in my name, but in your name. I perform miracles in your name, not, not my name. I, I've cast out demons in your name, not my name. And they expect, because of that, that they're going to go to be with the Lord. There are those who will tell you that the only thing you have to do to be saved is to believe. That there is nothing that you can do to save yourself except all you have to do is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing for you to obey. But in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1 and verse 8, this is what the Bible says, Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them who know not God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are many who expect to go to heaven that will be sorely disappointed because they never obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know no one will be saved apart from a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, no one comes unto the Father but by me. And if you're outside of Christ, if you've never claimed him as your Savior, if you've never obeyed the gospel, don't think you're going to heaven. Don't expect to go to heaven because you're not going to get there without a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people who are living in sin who have been told that it's okay, uh, you're going to go see the Lord when you die. Too many people think that because they were good husbands or good wives or good parents or, or they were good providers to their family, uh, that that's going to uh, allow them to go to heaven. If we could be saved by our own goodness, I've told you this before, 
If we could be saved by our own goodness, by the works that we do, Jesus Christ would not have needed to come and die on the cross if we could save ourselves. But the point is, we can't save ourselves by being good. We can only be saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, talking about people who live in sin, I want to share something just as, as an in, as illustration. Um, at First Christian Church in Bradenton, where I was the associate preacher, there was a lady there by the name of Carol Kyle, a wonderful Christian lady. I would go to visit her, and she did not want me to leave. When I had, I'd be there for an hour, and she'd say, "I'd say, well, I need to go." Well, really, do you need to go? And she, she, um, she came up with this thing, and I mentioned it at her funeral. She died, and. I said, I would visit Carol, and I would talk to her, and I'd say, well, Carol, I, I need to go. I've got other people to see. And, she, and this is after being there an hour, and then she said, well, wait a minute. And she'd open her Bible, and she'd bring up this list. She said, I have some questions I want to talk to you about, uh, about the Bible, and I'd end up staying there another hour. She just didn't want me to go. But one of the things about Carol, she had some real anxiety because she had a son who was in the theater in New York, and uh, he led an alternative lifestyle, and he contacted AIDS, and he came home to be with his mother and died in her spare bedroom of that disease. And that always bothered her. And she had a daughter named Tracy who lived an alternative lifestyle and uh, she lives in Safety Harbor. She's still there. And Tracy would come down to visit Carol. Uh, and sometimes when I came to visit her, um, she, she would be there. Her daughter Tracy would be there. We would talk. And I understood that, that uh, she lived an alternative lifestyle. Um, uh, but I was always very friendly and very kind to her. And one day she brought me a paper. And she says, I want you to read this paper and, um, and tell me what you think. It's three and a half pages, uh, written by some guy named, or woman, I don't know, Lee Sorensen. And it's why you can live an alternative lifestyle and still be a Christian. And so she uses a lot of Old Testament scripture, and she insinuates a lot of things that the Bible doesn't say. So, but for somebody living in that lifestyle, to them it made sense, I don't know why. And she, she said, uh, tell me what you think of that. So I wrote a three and a half page response to her uh, letter. And uh, when she came to visit Carol, she said, oh, did you read that article? I said, yes, I did. And she said, well, what did you think about it? And I said, I totally disagree with it. She got a frown on her face and she said, really? She said, well, where is it wrong? And I said, well, you take this home and read it. And then uh, look it over, read the scriptures that I quoted, and you, um, next time you're here, call me and I'll come back, we'll talk about it. About three days later, Carol Kyle called me on the phone and she said, Tracy just called me and said she was going to hell. And she was shook up. Oh, I boy. said, well, I'll, I'll talk to her when, when I see her. And I did. But when her mother died after the funeral, uh, I, I've never seen her again. I, tried, I sent her a few emails and she never responded. But she was one of those people who lived that lifestyle thinking all the time that it's okay, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That is a false expectation. The Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid that we should continue to live in sin, and they continue to live in that sin without any remorse, thinking that they are okay. There are people who are expecting to be ushered into heaven but they will not be allowed entrance. They will not be allowed entrance into heaven. 
there are many things that people expect that will not happen. If you don't believe in Christ, if you don't obey the gospel that calls for a person to repent of their sins and confess Christ as Savior, that uh, to, to be baptized, it is very unlikely that they were they are on that narrow road which leads to to heaven. Now, our eternal destiny. It's not for me to say whether a person or is or isn't going to heaven. That's God's decision to make. My responsibility is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as it is in the Bible and uh, let the chips fall where they may. Um, hopefully challenging people to see the error of their life. So in the time we have, let's move on. I want to talk about what we expect sometimes as churches and sometimes as Christians. Now, sitting at my desk this week working on the sermon, I thought about the fact that we're going to be blessed with property and a building on a major road. And I want to talk about that. There are congregations that expect great results while they put forth little effort. It is a false expectation to believe that great results will occur, that great accomplishments will had, be had by putting forth just a little bit of effort. Great results are only a possible if you put great effort into it. Many businesses die because the proprietor sits there in his business waiting for people to walk in the door and they don't and he fails. The farmer expects great results but he has to work to receive them. I've seen, I lived in Indiana, I lived by some farms, the first church I served was in Macedonia Christian Church and outside of Kokomo, Indiana between Kokomo and Greentown and the church sat right in the middle of some cornfields the cornfields around us and across the street from us. I'm, I grew up in Tampa. Warm winters. <laughs> Farmers cut that corn down in November and the winds blew and the snow came up in huge drifts and there were sheets of ice everywhere and after one winter in Indiana I said I want to go home. <laughs> it took me a long time to get back but I, I finally made it. But I used to farmers working their fields with their lights on in the tractor. They, they got so early in the morning with sunrise or before and they worked till after sunset at night. It took that kind of an effort for them to have the kind of crops that they wanted. The student doesn't become a valedictorian by doing just enough to get by. In the state of Florida, we have been blessed with a population of retired people. And a lot of our congregations in Florida, Christian churches, are made up, and other churches too, are made up primarily of, of retirees, and that's fine. But I want to tell you that some of these churches have made a serious mistake. They think that they just want to be a church for retirees. They, they don't want young people. They don't want children. They don't want a nursery. They just want a church that has churches just for the, the retirees, the older folks. And I know that because the last church I served in Bradenton is exactly that way. And I was there maybe a year when I first started as their associate preacher. And I said, I, got this, I went and bought a Bradenton City map and I located where the church was, building was on that map, and I looked down to see what, this, what a mile was on the map, and it told me, and I took a piece of, a little piece of string, and I held it down there, I cut it so it equal a mile, and I put a stick pin where the church building was, and I took that and I drew a circle around it, representing a mile around that church building, and I went to the elders, and I showed them my map, and I said, I want to visit every home in this circle. I thought that was a great idea. 
you can't do that. Why not? Well, people will come with children. <laughs> we have classrooms that we're not using. I said, yes. Well, we're a church many for older folks. I said, this church is not going to grow with that attitude. Oh, look, retirees come down Interstate 75 every day, and we'll get, we'll, we'll get our fair share of them. I thought, no, no, you won't. They don't even know we're here. They're on a church, that, they're on a street that dead ends. Unless you go down that street, you don't even know they're there. They're not a street sign down at the corner pointing people there. And so I, uh, I was discouraged by that, but of course I stayed. And uh, through some effort, um, the church did grow uh, because some retirees uh, I visited, they, they decided they would, they would go there. But the church just thought that just by being there and having their service <laughs> designed for older folks, that they would grow. And that was entirely a false expectation. Their attendance has continued to decline uh, because they're putting forth no effort I, the last Sunday I was there, the preacher asked me to preach since I was leaving there. Since I was living there, uh, leaving, and I challenged them to be evangelistic. And I pointed out to them, I had a copy of their annual budget, and there wasn't a single penny in their budget for evangelism, for soul winning. And I pointed that out to them, and uh, I guess it didn't make that much of a difference that I did. If a congregation is going to grow, we are going to have to win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. If we're going to have opportunities to teach people the word of God, we have to reach those people. If we are going to see our new building full of people who are zealous for God, it will take an effort on our part. Mediocrity will not produce great results. It is going to take great effort. I have a New Year's sermon. Probably won't get to preach it here. But it's titled, Let's Go Fishing. And one thing I learned about fishing is you have to go where the fish are. You can't walk out your front door and throw a blur in the lawn and think you're going to catch a fish. You, you have to go where they are. Sometimes it's kind of hard to find them. But you have to go. And it's the same way in the church. We can't expect that people are going to walk through our door because we're on a major highway uh, because we have a sign out in front and we have a building that people are just going to come walking through the door because we're there. Now there will be some, but if we're really going to grow, it's going to take some effort and work on our part to make that happen. And I would challenge you to, to understand that. We are living in an age when people are not attending Wednesday night Bible study. They're not attending morning worship service or Sunday night service. Christianity is in a decline. We are being condemned. We're called racist, narrow-minded, bigoted, because we adhere to biblical teaching. And those people aren't going to be reached unless we go out and reach them. When we move into our building, please don't expect that it's just going to grow on its own. Many congregations leave too much of their work to the preacher to do, but every member of New Life Christian Church must have a commitment to the sex success of the life of the church. Now, 
if you have a preacher who likes to visit, who is evan has a, an evangelistic mindset, a soul winning mindset, the most important thing you can do is get people to come. Invite them to come. People you meet, the random people. You see, I put that in my email. Your, your, your loved ones, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, and those random people you meet here for the week. Invite them to come. And if they'll fill out a card, the preacher will make an appointment to go visit them. Hopefully he will. And But that's one of the best things you can do is to help the church grow, is to invite people. You can't put it all on the shoulders of your preacher to do. Great results happen when we have make a great effort. I know you already understand that. I just want to reinforce what you already know. Let's move on. Another false expectation has to do with Christians. Many Christians believe that they can and will be blessed when they are not a blessing to anybody else. Do you remember the hymn, Make Me a Blessing? Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life, may Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, Savior I say, I pray make me a blessing to someone today. What a wonderful thing to be able to help and assist and share others. What a wonderful blessing it is. If you read my email that I sent out last Sunday, there were two notes in that email, one from Rachel and one from Jody, and both of them said what a blessing it was for us to reach out and help Rachel in her education. It makes your heart feel good when you do something for someone else, when you're a blessing to someone else. If you want to be blessed, be a blessing. Through the years, we will have many people come through the doors of New Life Christian Church. I challenge you, don't let anyone walk in the door, a stranger, a visitor, don't let them walk in the door without greeting them with a smile or a handshake and tell them how glad you are that they are here to visit with us. When they walk out the doors, I want them to say to themselves, or I want them to say who, to whomever they came with, what a blessing it was to be with that congregation this morning. Be a blessing to someone else. It will make you feel good. And, and by doing that, you will be blessed. Let's talk about friendship for a minute. It is true, if you want to be friends, you have to be uh, friendly. I don't know about you, I'm gonna confess something here to you that's true about most preachers. Most preachers have very few friends. We have lots of acquaintances. We know a lot of people, but solidly good, close friends, preachers have very few of them. When preachers have close friends within the church, those friends will start talking about other people in the church, trying to see if the preacher will agree with them or not. Preachers don't have a lot of close friends within the church because if he does, people will start saying, well, those, those people right there, they're a click. Uh, they're attached to the preachers if they do everything together. And so because of that, to protect himself and his family and to keep people from gossiping, um, preachers have a tendency not to make close friendships within the church. I could count the friends I have on one hand. I mean solidly good friends that I can count on when I have a need or need help that I can call them and know that they'll be there for me and they know I'll be there for them. 
but most preachers don't have very many friends because they don't want things to get started in the congregation that will undermine his work and will undermine the church. But in spite of that, we all preachers need to be friendly. It's part of their makeup as preachers. They need to be friendly. And most preachers I know are very friendly people. We live in an age, we work our, with our responsibilities at home and the things that we have to do as parents or whatever, uh, we, we, we stay busy. And because we are busy, we don't have friends like the world used to have. Um, I can remember when I was a kid uh, living in Chicago, every house had a front porch. And in the evening, everybody sat out on a front porch. And you would walk down the street, and you would know every one of them. And they would know you, and you would say hello, and they would talk to you. Um, it was a friendly neighborhood. We all knew each other in the neighborhood. Today, people come home from work, they push a button in a car, the garage door goes up, they pull in, garage door closes, and they never see their neighbors. Seldom ever talk to them. But the Bible need challenges us to be friendly, and we will not grow as a congregation if we are not a friendly people. It is always good to be friendly. Friendly to your co-workers, to your neighbors. Um, friendly uh, as customers. I go into Publix or any grocery store, and if the cashier is wearing a name tag, I call her by name. And I usually always ask, how are you today? And I always call her by name. I am doing just fine, whatever their name is. They kind of look at you sometimes like, wow, call me by my name. One of the things I do, <laughs> I have this, not a close friend, but a friend. And we're going to jump over the Sunshine Skyway, and I stopped at the toll booth to pay my bucket of quarter. And the toll booth worker had a name on. And I called him by name and said, how are you today? Oh, I'm fine and stuff, and we drove away. And this friend said, you talk to everybody. <laughs> and I said, I said, can you imagine that lady standing there in that booth all day long or for whatever shift and the people throw them money because they hate to pay? Don't say hello to them, don't talk to them, and just drive away. It pays to be friendly to people. When you say hello and call a toll booth worker by their name, you watch their expression on their face when you do that. They smile at you. They're surprised that anybody would talk and smile to them. But it pays to be friendly. If we want friends, we have to be friendly, especially those to those who come in our door. When I first retired from New Life, uh, New Life uh, First Christian Church in Brayton, I decided I was going to visit all the Christian churches in our area. And I did. I went to the churches in Sarasota and Northport. And I went to one church in Sarasota. I, I got a bulletin at the front door. The person said hello. Then asked me in a word, except said hello. I went into the building. It was dark. It was dark in there. The only lights they had on were lights that were facing the stage where all the instruments were. I thought it was going to a concert or something. And, um, and not a single person said hello to me, how are you, it's good to see you, nothing. And when, when I got done, I left, having said hello to one person, and that was the person who handed me a bulletin when I walked in the door. Now, I could have got up and walked around and shook people's hand and introduced myself. Maybe I should have done that. I do that sometimes. But we will not be successful if we're not a friendly <coughs> church. So I don't know a more friendly congregation than this one, okay. at least among ourselves. Uh, but we have to be friendly uh, to those that we don't know. Now, we don't do these things in order to have someone do them for us. But just know that the person who is unreliable, who never extends a helping hand, who is unwilling to help, 
who is always selfish, that person will probably live a very lonely life. It pays to be a blessing to others, to be a friend to others. I want to close with this story. It's a story from history about an old man named John. John never owned a horse and carriage. John was crippled with arthritis and other infirmities that he had that came with old age. He dragged himself along the side of the road with the aid of a cane. One day a neighbor saw John laboriously and painfully prying protruding rocks from the road with his cane and moving the rocks out of the way. Hey, John, the neighbor said, how come you're doing that when you don't even own a buggy? Old John straightened up the best he could and smiled and said, it will make it easier for them that do. John is an example of unselfish service. Jesus said, he that would be greatest among you let him be servant of all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your, for your word and what it teaches. Father, I know that you called us to serve you in the life of the life Christian church. Father, I pray that as we continue to make decisions to move and to relocate and to build a building, Father, that you might inspire all of us to be a blessing and a friend to others and to welcome people into our church that they might find a family and a home that they can worship with. Father, help us to realize the importance of being a blessing to others and being a friend to others. We want to be a blessing and a friend, not because we want that in return, although it's always good, but because we know that you've called us to emulate Christ in our own life. Father, bless our congregation, bless each of us, that we walk faithfully with you, that we are faithful and true to your word, and Father, what it teaches, and I pray, Lord, that through our efforts and through our work that we will grow. In Christ's name, amen.